So hello, my name is Eunice. I don't know why I started by saying my name, but we will cut that out. <laughs> so um, this week we are on uh, the series number three on Community Rewired. And this week we get to speak about boldness. And what does that look like for us as a church? So we carry on with uh, the book of Nehemiah. We are talking on chapter two from verse one to 10. So I'll read it out, but if you don't have your Bible with you, uh, if it's not on your phone, uh, I understand that the verses will come up on the screen. So Nehemiah chapter two, one to 10. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in the presence of the king before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? So the king said to me, what is it that you want? Then I prayed to God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. The king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you, be, when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me a safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have letter to Asaph, keep out of the royal park, so that he will give me timber to make beams for the gate of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. Because the gracious hand of God was on me, the king granted my request. So I went to the governor of Trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters. The king had also sent army officers and a cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite officio heard about this, they were very much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. So where is the church being called out to be, to be bold, to not simply be a pale imitation of what the church should look like, but to be bold, to stand out, to do things that other people are free to do? And what is our movement before the king? And how is that going to reflect in the way that we um, rebuild our city and our community? So I believe that the church is twofold. It is very much on a personal level and it is also us together. It is you and me, and we are the ones being called out to be bold, to rebuild the city of God, to rebuild where brokenness has occurred. So what does that look like practically for us? You know, I believe that a bold church grieves over the brokenness in the city. So in this passage, we see Nehemiah sad before the king. He heard about what happened in Judah and he can no longer contain the sadness that he feels. He's asking the Lord, what is my calling? What is my responsibility here? So he is sad before the king because he knows um, the state of uh, Jerusalem. And I wonder, how do we respond to brokenness in our community? Do we cry out to God? Do we weep and moan for the brokenness that we see? And how often do we cry out to God for our leaders? Do we pray for them? Do we pray for the good leaders that we have? And do we pray for the leaders who are um, not good, they are corrupt and they are bad? Or do we simply run on to uh, social media, uh, on Twitter, and complain about them, and then we move on and we forget uh, what's happened. 
You know, we sing this song that says, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. Hmm. I think if we took a moment to really understand what it is that we say and what it is that we ask the Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. You know, a broken heart is unsettled. It grieves, it is in pain. I remember when I used to ask the Lord, um, what is my role? What do I do when it comes to uh, in the area of human trafficking and people who are sexually exploited? And that went on for 10 years um, from the moment when I realized that um, human trafficking is a thing and people are trafficked for sexual exploitation. And I would cry out to God and say, God, I cannot settle because I feel that there is something that I should do, but I don't know what it is that I should do. And God was breaking my heart for the victims. God was breaking my heart and telling me that there is something that I could do, even if I did not know what it is that I was supposed to be doing. Nehemiah before the king, his heart is broken. He is grieving. You know, our community rewired means that we are constantly crying out to God, petitioning on behalf of the broken, the lost, and the hurting. So in this time when COVID is happening and so many people hurting, are we crying out to God? And what do we say in those moments? You know, our bold church prays that God's will be done. So in this chapter, we see that Nehemiah, um, as he is before the king, and the king asks him, why do you look so sad and what do you want? And then Nehemiah prays to God. You know, often enough when uh, we are presented with a challenge, it's so, um, I know that for myself, that sometimes I will want to just jump into doing something instead of speaking to God first or consulting God and asking God, but what is your will here, God? And I feel that that's what Nehemiah does. Before he utters what his request is to the king, he speaks to God. So that his will and God's will is aligned. And that's what, as a bold church, we should be like, is to consult God. God, what is your will for this city? What is your will for us as a church? And, you know, we don't wake up one day and we are bold. I feel like boldness is something that we practice. We're constantly checking in with God and saying, what is it that we should be doing? How should we be responding to uh, the many people, thousands of people being put in prison for uh, the wrong reasons or unjustly put in prison? It's constantly checking with God and saying, what is it that we should be doing? How should we be responding? And I feel that that's what, as a church, being bold means. It's constantly being in alignment with God. And you know, we pray that prayer and we say, God, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is a scary prayer. Because what we are saying to God is that we are willing to surrender our will to you. We will take on what your will is, what your desires are. And you know, I often hear people say when they are asked, um, how can I pray for you? And people say, I want God to grant me the desires of my heart. You know, I'm not saying that this is wrong, but if I think about my desires, and I have so many, you know, I desire that one day I will have a family. I come from a, a small family, I'm the only child. And my desire is that I will have a big family, many kids. And you know, only recently that it dawned on me um, during my quiet time that what if that never happens? What if God's idea for a family for me is not what I desire or it's not what I know? What if his idea is so different? So this is a bold prayer when we say, your will be done we are saying that we will follow you no matter the cost. And I like that Adrian talked about the cost last week. What is the cost in following Christ? What is the cost in being bold? What is the cost in saying to God, you know, your desires and not mine, your will and not mine? 
But I like what God says in Psalm 139 that He made me, He made you in the secret place. He wove you together and He ordained every day of your life. So He knows where your plan is. He knows where our plan as a church is. So I think for us, going to God and saying, God, your will, but not ours. So we know and we're trusting in God that his plan for us is good. And what he has planned for our, our lives and for our church is good. So as a community, for us to be rewired is, is saying to God, you know, we want your will to take precedent. And, you know, sometimes when I think about what our what my desires are and I think about them and sometimes they're very inadequate and now I see what God um, can do through me and um, and using me and I just understand how much God cares for me and how much he knows that I can do so what does it look like as letting go of our will and letting the will of God be the one that takes charge in our life and in our church I think there is so much that we can do, so much that we can um, dare God to do if we let him guide us and guide our will. And my other point is a bold church is willing to risk its reputation and suffer persecution. You know, nobody wants to suffer. I think we constantly want to have a easy and simple and comfortable life. And I see what Nehemiah, um, I see Nehemiah in this chapter and what he's giving up. You know, Nehemiah is a uh, cupbearer to the king. That means he's the king's right hand, right hand man. He's trusted by the king. He has prestige when it comes to uh, King Atzaxis. And he is willing to give this up. What could have happened to Nehemiah? if the king did not like his request. He could have been denied his permission. He could have been put in jail. You know, he could have lost all the relationship that he has with the king and um, his colleagues. He could have been killed. That was uh, potential for Nehemiah. So what are we ready to risk? Are we ready to die for what God has called us to do? What is it? What's the cost that we are going to give up? You know, um, when it comes to Rajesha uh, and my family, they don't understand what it is that I do. And I've tried to explain, you know, um, we go out to the streets and we're serving sex workers. And I remember my, one of my uncles asking me, so wait, you went to the UK, spent 10 years, had a good education and you come back and this is what you want to do. It feels as though you're wasting your education to me. And you know, at that point, I hadn't thought of it like that, of me wasting my education. And then it took me a second to really understand where he's coming from. He's saying to me, you're ruining your reputation. I felt that that's what he was saying to me. You know, what does that look like for me hearing that? 10 years and a really good education that I paid for. And I, I wanna, and I'm saying to God, but God, your will, where have you called me into? I wanna be bold and step in, even though that means that I am risking the reputation that my family has of me, even though I'm risking the reputation that people think of me um, and the education that I got. I want to be bold and step out and follow you. And you know, I'm looking at this passage and there is Tobiah and Sanballat who are disturbed by Nehemiah, what he has chosen to do. Um, and when I think about every good story, there is a villain. There is someone who will always be there to remind you that what you're doing is not right. And what does that look like for us as a church when we are choosing to love people who other people will choose to ignore? when we're choosing to call out brokenness, when we're choosing to call out the heart in our community, when we're choosing to call out leaders who are not doing what's right to people in our community, that will come at a cost. 
that will come at us risking our reputation. That will come at us risking being prosecuted. But are we willing to risk it all um, to follow God? You know, whenever the church has faced opposition, and this is so much even with the early church, and even in people who have made great change in the community, they've always, um, there's always something good has come out of uh, opposition. I think about uh, people like uh, Corrie ten Boom. I love her story of her um, during the time of um, when the German have invaded uh, Netherlands and the Jews are being persecuted and Corrie ten Boom and her family opens up their, their household to rescue hundreds and hundreds of Jews so that they can, they're not killed. What is that for Corrie ten Boom? What is it that they had to risk? They risked the reputation, they risked their own family, they risked being killed, they risked going to prison and that did happen. You know, they lost their father in prison and their sister. And Corrie ten Boom coming out and having lost all of that that she had lost, but for the sake of following God, for the sake of rescuing um, the Jews in the community. So what would it look like for us, saying that we are going to work with sex workers, we are going to work with prisoners. We are going to lose a lot of people. We are going to lose our reputation. But that's what it means to be a bold church, is to risk it all and follow God. And then for me, a bold church is a church that understands that it has a responsibility. You know, in the words of late Ravi Zacharias, he says that the biggest mistake that we often make in life into the task that God has called us into is to think and believe that there isn't much that we can do. And you know, I see that in the church sometimes and in some, sometimes in the church, in our own community, is to think that there isn't much that we can do. There isn't much that God can do through us. And that is a great tragedy. Because I think if we fully understand the God that we serve and the God whose gracious hand is on us, then we would know how much we are capable of doing. You know, Nehemiah goes to the king and says, and the king asks him, what is it that you want? And he says, I want letters to the governor of Trans Euphrates and I want a letter to Asaf, the keeper of the, of the park. But God had more planned for him. He gets more than he asks for. The king grants him army officers and a cavalry to go with him. So what is it? How would we think about boldness or how would we respond to our community if we understood the God that we serve and how much resources he has availed um, for us? You know, when we think about where there is a, a, a godly ask, there is also a godly provision that he will provide. In our weakness, he makes us strong. In the areas where we think that we are not capable, he is right there with us. And I think about when I um, read Jesha and when we were thinking of starting and just thinking, God, is it really me? Am I the right person? And I felt so inadequate. And I say this often because it's true. And I still do. Sometimes I feel that I'm not the right person for this job. But then God reminds me that he made me and the power that he exerted to raise Christ from the dead is the same power that lives in me and lives in church through us through us together as the church we have that power to do great and immense incredible things in our community so a bold church understands that we have capacity and we have a responsibility to do so as I close what is our moment before the king and what does that look like what will we ask will we grieve for our community will we weep for the brokenness in the community our moment before the king do we do only what we desire or do we ask the will of god to take president do we choose to surrender um, our desires and what we think we know and ask God what is it that you want for our community and how do we step out and willing to be guided by you and are we going to be bold in what we ask for asking for a godly provision 
and a godly vision, asking to drive God's agenda. I think there is so much that we can do in this community. And I think we are positioned uniquely in this community for a reason. So as we press on thinking in boldness and what that looks like and how we step out, I pray for us that we will continue to be in conversation with God, that we will continue to seek God and ask him to guide us and to direct us. Thank you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you asking that you would make us bold, asking that you would show us what this means for us as a church and for us as individuals. God, I pray for the areas in our communities that you're calling us to respond to, for the brokenness, for the hurting that you're calling us, God, to attend to. I ask God that you will give us everything that we need, that you will give us a godly provision, that you will give us an understanding that you have your gracious hand on us, that you will give us the understanding to know that we can trust you. God, I pray for everything that is happening in our community right now that needs a bold church to respond to. We pray in these times of COVID when there are so many people suffering, so many people going hungry. Lord, what is our responsibility? How are you calling us into this area? And God, what is it that we are going to risk as a church to attend to the brokenness? What is it that we're going to risk as a church to love on those who have been uh, ostracized by the community and to choose to love them even that even if it means that we lose and we risk um, losing our reputation god would you give us the boldness that we need would you would your gracious hand guide us as a church so that we will only hear you and listen to you and constantly checking in with you so God, guide us, be with us. In your name we pray. Amen.